Welcome. Um, it's interesting, the, the entire day, the uh, uh, overarching theme has been AI and machine learning for the most part. Uh, so this particular panel is really the intersection of startup, uh, the innovation creativity associated with bootstrapping a startup, finding uh, market fit, and either enabling AI or applying AI. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves for about three minutes. Um, so why don't we start here? Why don't we start with Modar? Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Modar Alawi. I'm founder and CEO of Iris. And uh, we're about four years old. We started with Emotion AI, um, which is a computer vision software that reads people's facial micro expressions. And uh, we evolved to developing a, uh, a true face reading AI with about 30 more analytics that involve head position, eye tracking, age, gender, yawning, microsleep, all of that good stuff. We've um, complemented um, face analytics with upper body analytics uh, because it is uh, um, synergistic not only from uh, technology standpoints but also from use case standpoints. And today we focus primarily on human behavior understanding inside autonomous and highly automated vehicles. Um, I guess that's been only a minute. So uh, we- What uh, stage of startup, I don't know, where are you in your funding uh, cycles and so on? You're good, yeah. So we've, uh, we've uh, so we have a mature product that's going in production in the next two years. We've announced a number of uh, automotive OEMs and tier ones over the last two years, and that includes uh, Toyota, Honda, Bosch, and a number of them. Uh, this is in the public domain already. And um, the applications primarily are around safety for the driver, but also for the occupant, as well as augmenting the user experience and the human machine interface inside the vehicle, primarily because we see most of the efforts today in, on, in autonomous uh, vehicles vision is on the exterior perception and not so much on the interior. And uh, it does matter just as much. And so we find ourselves talking to um, powertrain departments within OEMs that have absolutely nothing to do with AI or with the interior, but they wanted to understand what's happening inside the car and therefore uh, proactively um, adapt the vehicle's reactive response systems accordingly. So uh, it's been interesting for us to uh, see how far what we've built in the last couple of years uh, is uh, kind of uh, evolving and we continue to learn from this every day. Perfect. Suleiman, Atir. Hi, I'm Suleiman Aitani. I'm the founder and CEO of Ethere. And I think we're a bit different because we're an AR company fundamentally. Uh, but I'm here because AR and AI are intertwined. And we believe that augmented reality is what allows AI to add to people instead of replacing them. So I started Ethere in 2012. Uh, we've raised around $41 million right now, so we're, we're kind of a grown-up startup. Uh, and we have like 100 patents all on, uh, actually both <coughs> AR and AI. And fundamentally the idea is when the digital world is all around you in a number of ways, in the sensing and in the augmentation way, when your glasses or, or your computer is sensing everything around you, and it's giving you all of that information. How do you interact with it? What's the u right user experience? What's the right way for people to live in that world where the computer can assist them as much as possible? Right? The next generation of the internet will not be a place where you go look for information and get it. It will be where AI is there kind of being your guardian angel. Um, Right, and sending you the right information at the right time, supporting you with your experiences. 
Uh, and so, yeah, we started in 2012, 2013, we were actually at All Things D showing for the first time ever mobile glasses that you can, you know, open a 3D newspaper and the airplanes would come fly around you and go in and stuff like that. Just some cool things to show the potential. And since then, we were looking at the market and studying it carefully. Around the middle of 2013, this is kind of at the peak of Google Glass, um, we realized that this market will start in the enterprise. And so we started developing enterprise collaboration and uh, efficiency uh, tools and software on top of our platform for the interaction. Uh, and we started working with leading, uh, leading enterprise uh, companies, mainly automotive, you think industrial manufacturing and all of these people, people who need information while they are getting their hands dirty, while they're actually doing work. Um, and we believe we, AR, will do to these workers what the PC did to the desk workers. And then from there on, it goes to, you know, to all other applications as, uh, as the technology matures. Um, and right now, yeah, we are shipping actually the, the latest news, Toshiba, their, um, their AR glasses will ship with our software. We also signed a similar deal with Flextronics. So we work with OEM, ODM partners so that the glasses already have the software uh, in it. And also we work with the users themselves, we, uh, our applications. So Porsche is rolling our solution to all of their dealerships in the US uh, and then Europe. Um, and, um, and we get the insights from there and tie it back. And fundamentally, both for the user interface and learning how to help people be more efficient, AI is at the core, right? You're learning from every worker. You're seeing from their point of view what they're doing. And you see your top 1% worker and your average worker, right? And you can learn from their efficiencies. The data is kind of labeled or already, right, timestamped, labeled. It's like if gr these are great use cases for AI. Uh, and that's how it ties to, to what we're talking about here. Thank you, Suleiman. Ivan? Hello, my name is Ivan, <coughs> and I'm CEO of My Body AI. And we're building the educational voice assistant for children. And this is actually my second voice AI company. Uh, my co-founder and I uh, started at Cubic AI, we were building a, you know, s like a smart speaker similar to Amazon Echo before Alexa was announced. And in 2016, uh, like the hardware of a part of a company was acquired. And we started to look for like a new use case because we kind of understand how, how to do voice, how to build like a great voice experience. And uh, you know, actually, our children helped us to, to, to find this use case. Uh, so we understood that you cannot teach uh, you know, speech-related skills uh, with, with only with text. So you need uh, oral practice, and you need like a live feedback. But uh, the number of students exceed the amount of teachers dramatically in the world, like 100,000 English teachers are needed now in China. And how, how can you fix that? Uh, you know, it's impossible, but it, at the same time, it's a $15 billion market opportunity. And so we thought we can solve this with, with AI and with, with voice. And we decided that we will build an, you know, voice assistant English teacher, uh, which is my body AI. So basically, we designed a natural language understanding technology, uh, especially to, to understand <laughs> the way children speak. Uh, it, it complies with uh, regulation like, like COPA, and it really tuned to, to the way yeah, ch children understand, uh, children speak. And so we help children with this technology in our solution. We help children to, uh, you know, it, with this, uh, via talking with a virtual character, to learn uh, vocabulary, uh, practice dialogues, and uh, develop their pronunciation. So it works kind of like, uh, uh, you know, remote teachers that uh, teach students via Skype, but instead of a real human, we have like a funny virtual robot 
that lives in an environment like a, like a video game. And it's fully automated and uh, it's available on a monthly subscription uh, priced at the half of a hourly rate of a tutor. So we want to make it as available as possible. And basically, uh, in this way, we're trying to solve the shortage of, uh, of teachers, which was, you know, the major problem of humanity for, for centuries. So at least, at least partially. So yeah, so since we are mostly, my co-founder and I, we're mostly AI guys, uh, we figured that we need, uh, we need real teachers and uh, we need educators and game designers. So we found a guy uh, who was an ex-lead game designer and producer at LeapFrog and uh, designed a ton of uh, educational experiences for kids. And we also hired a, like, real uh, tut remote tutors, you know, who, who teach English. And so we're trying to adapt techniques that they use, like tactics that real remote teacher, teachers use to, uh, to build this simple voice experience that that works and 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 and, and that works uh, so we soft launched last december we started in april around a year ago uh, last december we launched we got featured on app store and now we are growing like 15 percent a, a week so that's kind of our story great thanks ivan pedro hi pedro alves founder and ceo at opal I've been doing AI machine learning for about 16 years in seven different industries and um, I've seen you know, what it can do and I've also seen the disappointments. I like to say that the normal track a big company takes to you know, bring AI to their company looks something like this, one to two years trying to hire an AI team and then two years finding out that they hired the wrong people and firing them and then go back to hiring, right? And that's sad. I think the biggest reason for that is a great data scientist, machine learning scientist is a unicorn, right? It's a software engineer, machine learning scientist, mathematician, statistician, good communicator, understands the business. That's what it takes. And there's, you can't have a massive amount of people that do that, right? So I want to see AI change the world. I think everybody does. But guess what? Nothing has ever changed the world until it became easy, cheap, and ubiquitous, right? The phone, the car, the computer. AI is not one of those three things right now. And that, that's a problem. So. I started a company to build software, and basically what the software is, is AI that builds AI. The idea is that this will make doing the job easier. Once it's easy, then more people can do it. When more people can do it, then it will become cheap. Once it's easy and cheap, then every company can actually use it, and then it will become ubiquitous, right? So that's, that's the path that I see for AI actually impacting every, every company out there. Um, uh, our company is a year old. We have 17 people and we have uh, V2 of the product and paying customers. Um, one little thing I wanted to say, somebody mentioned in the previous uh, round, they said the dirty little secret of data scientists, right, 80% wrangling and 20% complaining about it. Um, I wanted to say, I think the dirty little secret of the dirty little secret of data scientists, it's that's probably actually 20% wrangling the data and 80% complaining about it. So I think it might be the other way around. Um, that's it. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's an excellent one. I'm really intrigued to understand uh, what aspect of a, a data scientist role is more naturally done by your software and what is it that is still the, the kind of the domain of the humans? There's obviously an advancing boundary. Yeah. Can you help describe that? Yeah, and a lot of people think, oh, this is the end of the data scientist, and I, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I think the best example of what you're saying is our first customer, they had a chief data scientist and nine data scientists under him. And he said, look, right now, I'm the only guy doing strategic thinking, problem formulation, the guy that's having ideas of how can we use machine learning to improve the business. And then he sets up the problems, and then he says, and then I shove it to one of these nine guys, or maybe a couple, and then they just churn, feature engineering, algorithm selection, you know, hyperparameter optimization, and productionizing the model. And he said, if you're saying that your software can do all that, then that means all nine of them can do what I'm doing today, which means we'll have 10 people doing what I'm doing, which is what I think is valuable. That's what he said. And I agree perfect, you know, completely. That, the machines won't be able to take over anytime soon because it takes creative thinking. You know, it's, it's way more out of the box than just doing things to get a better model out. 
And that's, I think, the shift of the data scientist job. That's the data scientist of the future. They're going to be doing strategic thinking, more high level, and the lower level things the machines will be doing. So that's they're going the to be really mapping the, the actual application and the, and the sort of the, the, the business pattern or the user pattern yeah. uh, and let some of the work of algorithm selection and optimization and data cleaning and so on to the software. Yes. Fair to say? Yeah, that's fair. Okay, assumption. okay good. Uh, so I'm going to jump around with some questions here. Uh, so Suleiman, with, uh, with what you do, I can picture a world where um, the industrial workers and the people who are not sitting on their desk at their desk looking at a computer are now enabled in a way that doesn't require extra hands and so on to, to do functions that are, uh, in some sense, what we consider today white collar work, more, more complex uh, decision making, more targeted actions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are you, uh, so this is very fascinating because it's, it's, it's clearly showing that AI is at the, at, the, at the root of this uh, AR experience. Um, are you competing with a bunch of other companies in this space? Are you pioneering this space? Just where are you? So, yeah, of course, this is not, it's, it's very obvious. It's very obvious that if we can learn from everyone in the team and give that information back to the right people at the right time, we can just empower people extremely significantly. And so a number of companies is, uh, are approaching this. Our, our main focus is uh, going straight to AI with focused use cases. I think that's kind of the, the difference in how we approach it. Uh, but in general, there are like five, six startups and maybe five, six public companies uh, that are looking at this. Uh, and each one of them is coming from their own direction, right, given their background. Mm -hmm. If a company's background is P in PLM, mm -hmm. they try to say, okay, how can we get the information about product to help people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this is becoming a very, very hot field and like training for your people, right? right? They, they get and write on the job, they have the experience of every single person who worked before them, mm -hmm. right? And um, error detection, once a problem happens, somebody makes a mistake, yeah. they used to learn from it. Now, every one of your workers learns from every mistake. It's, yeah. um, and so that's kind of how we're approaching it. Got uh, it. The task flows, um, you know, and identifying those key moments, always measuring the time uh, and the ROI and seeing how it can be optimized. How, how? sort of vertical industry and flow specific and how transferable across vertical industry yeah. are, you, are you finding things? Uh, that's, that's a challenging question, right, in, in anything that you do. Uh, particularly, and here I'm laying cards on the table, um, our approach is the following. First is that we, we try a number of, uh, of verticals where we think, you know, and we talk to experts and all of that, uh, and, the, and we see there's always a 2080 pickup. And then we cut down and we focus on the 20. We expand that again, and within that we find the 2080. So we're in our second iteration of that. Uh, we started looking at like 35 possible, and they're all viable, right? And it's kind of the same use case, but there are cultural things. There's you know, the hesitation in terms of what people are ready and not ready to do. Uh, and within that, we, at the first time, we saw automotive, aerospace, uh, there's construction, which we were surprised, insurance, which we were unbelievably surprised, uh, and healthcare. But insurance, in terms of inspection, right, if they have the instructions, they're recording everything, right, and all of that, and learning, like you see, uh, I saw this fissure, or whatever, this thing, and, and the factory stopped working after a while, so I should you know, increase the, in, the insurance if I see that later, things like that. Yeah. Um, and then we currently, we zoomed it back in to focus more on manufacturing and automotive. So we're, that's our process. Very good. Um, Modar, you're, 
your uh, software seems very promising in terms of, uh, there are many a times I recall when I was doing a long drive and uh, I'm feeling really, 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 really sleepy. And uh, the fact I'm still living is a testament to the fact that somehow, random chance, uh, made me aware of that uh, and jerk to awake, awakeness before something happened to the car. So in, especially in this world of autonomous driving, uh, I can see how what you are bringing to market can create a better acceptability to letting go uh, uh, of, of driving and so on and so forth. But it seems to come with concerns about just the fact that you got so much information about me in whatever state I'm in, it seems to me that given the explosion of privacy concerns that is ha happening in society that that's something that uh, you would contend with. So I want to get your comments in terms of the value, the concerns, and, and how universal these, uh, these concerns are given the, 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 the national and other societal variations in, in terms of just thinking about privacy. Yeah, so any time somebody deals with human behavior understanding, they obviously deal with um, some level of sensitive data. Uh, it's, for, for us, it's pretty simple. You, you, we, we design the technology with privacy in mind. You design it for processors that are not able to record any images or videos um, at all. These are embedded systems that can just barely power the software. And um, you also try to tackle industries where user consent is given. So it used to be a, a, you know, a topic that comes up um, you know, maybe three, four years ago um, when we first uh, initially mentioned that we were going to talk about driver monitoring for, uh, you know, you use the technology for driver monitoring, and et cetera. It was kind of both received with skepticism as well as a lot of enthusiasm. And then fast forward a couple of years later, um, you know, I was just mentioning to you earlier, uh, when you have a couple of large manufacturers, car manufacturers, uh, putting a camera in front of the driver in vehicles of 2018 and, 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 and up, um, and then when you have the NHGSA and the regulating bodies push for um, uh, innovative approaches for uh, monitoring the driver and, and the passengers, uh, you kind of see that the benefits outweigh any privacy implications that if there is any, or if there are any privacy implications. Again, not only the technology is being designed with, um, with, with privacy in mind, but, but also, you know, there is a, there is a, uh, like a you know a, a, an, an additional layer of one having user consents and typically when you buy a car um, you literally uh, sign off on that user uh, agreement and um, oftentimes people don't know what's what's in there and if they don't <laughs> right. and if they don't then then of course uh, you know you want to make sure that at least the technology has been designed with uh, with privacy in mind so we do remain a um, um, some sort of an AI company that provides data analytics to customers. Um, it is up to customers to carry on that trend and uh, maintain the privacy of, of the users. As long as it is non-personally identifiable information, then, um, then, then it is okay. Um, uh, th there is a, a privacy uh, um, guideline that was initiated by both the FTC and the uh, NHGSA a couple of years ago, which we've contributed to, um, uh, and it literally spells out the 20 steps that each company that deals with um, potential personally identifiable information, how they, they need to, uh, to work around it. Now, OEMs and third-party companies can take that information, put it up the cloud, and sell it to others and do all sorts of things. 
we uh, we have nothing to do uh, with that, and 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 uh, we certainly don't design our software to be cloud-based to begin with. So, um, I guess the final thought here is, uh, as long as um, a technology is designed with privacy in mind, and as long as um, the technology targets um, embedded systems or targets basically if it's a software that runs on the edge rather than um, uh, relying on uh, any cloud-based uh, analysis. Uh, I think, uh, I th and as long as you have uh, consumer consent, uh, I, I believe you can alleviate any privacy concerns. So a key thing I took out of what you said is it's not a black box on the car that you take out after the fact and find five hours of recording. It is more something that you're doing on the fly. That's right. And, and, it's a real-time and, and, process. Yeah. And you are enabling decisions and other things that are life-saving yeah. to be made on the fly on, the, on that information. That's right. So not only that we preach that initially, but we also see customers and OEMs today, uh, Cadillac particularly, they put a camera in front of the driver for their uh, CT6 2018 model. Um, um, it's called the Super Cruise feature. And so, um, you know, you would think that they've also uh, thought about it and, and uh, privacy is not something that comes up anymore when it comes to saving lives. And as long as the technology uh, is, is designed in a way that is non-privacy invasive. Yeah, good point, thank you. Uh, Ivan, you, are, you talked about um, educational applications. Obviously, you can see there's a very compelling market for uh, bridging the gap between just a do-it-yourself YouTube on the one hand and getting a, a you know, fairly expensive and hard to get tutor for various subjects on the other hand. It would seem to me that you, you have very different behavior patterns. You know, when you're looking at a child educating, you know, a child of a certain age group, and probably in a certain country or society, that's different from the way some adults learn, and there is probably a lot of targeting and nuancing associated with that. So uh, I'm interested to see how, how wide and narrow your, your, your scope can be, um, and how do you pick your targets? So initially, we, now we're focusing on uh, children like 5 to 12. Uh, and it's m mostly not target on age, but uh, we are targeting beginners. Uh, and so the idea is, like the big vision, is actually to build the AI assistant that would grow with the child mm -hmm. and adapt the curriculum while the child is, 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 is learning. So the more content we will have on, on the platform and the more data we will have about the particular student, the better it, it, work, it will work for, uh, for, for a particular student. And so someday we want to, uh, to create like, a, yeah, like the educational assistant that you, know, you will give it to your child at the age of, let's say, four, and then it will grow with you up to the, I don't know, maybe your child would not want to switch to Siri or whatever <laughs> when she will grow up. So yeah. So the tutor, your machine, le your machine learning tutor is growing up with the child. Yes. So uh, you start at three years old and it's adapting its behavior as the child goes on. It's got more and more insight into the child and the child becomes a teenager. Your machine learning is interacting in a very different way and has a notion of where the child came from, how its interaction is modulated. So it's growing up with the child. Right, right. So that's the big vision. But as a startup, we, we have to start small and, uh, you know, with, a, with a, like a, and a focus on... So now we're focusing on beginners uh, and, yeah, mostly children. So why do we start so early, like five years old? Because, let's say, in China, 70% of children start to learn English at the before five years old, and it's this age they cannot read their local language, so we have to design like the voice first experience for for kids. So that's 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 why we start with with, with five, but later we will, we plan to so we start with uh, teaching English as a foreign language, but we we have like a vision of a 
educational platform in mind. And so uh, it's sometime we, we plan to open it for uh, educators, storytellers to, to build uh, you know, like a custom um, you know, custom lessons or uh, to make it uh, open to teach, you know, other speech related skills and maybe even like some social skills. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask one question of Pedro and then I'm going to open it up for the audience when we have about five minutes left. Uh, Pedro, your value proposition of uh, essentially supercharging your, your uh, data scientist or effectively getting a lot more out of a certain amount of data scientist capacity sounds enormously compelling. There's probably a lot of people here that are interested in saying, hey, how do I use it? How do I use it? In, in my company, Zorient, we have a group that's doing AI and machine learning. The choke point is really the data scientists. Right? They are so busy, uh, we are constrained in terms of how many projects we can take on. The demand side is strong. How do we use your software? Yeah, that, that's a good point because that's a strategy a lot of the big companies take, which is creating a central hub, a data science team that serves all the different groups within the organization. And what ends up happening is you have two or three groups that are the favorites, and those are the ones that get access to the data science team, and then you have you know, 30 other groups that are just, you know, just waiting, right. either trying to hire their own or just hopes that one day one of those data scientists is going to free up uh, for them. The, the same example, actually, uh, with that um, customer with the nine data scientists, the, the day they actually decided to go with us, we, had, um, we gave them a data set a week before we went there and said, have your data scientists work on it for a week, tune the model, and see how well they can do it. So we went there and did a demo in 20 minutes. We got something that was way more accurate than what they did in a week. And the CTO wasn't impressed at all, which I loved. He was like, you know, this is BS. You chose the data set. I don't care. Let me see what you do with my data set. So right there, you know, I looked over my COO sweating a little bit, you know, a little bit of sweat. <laughs> and I was like, no, let's do this, you know. So what happened was in 20 minutes, we had something that was more accurate than what took them two and a half months to do. Uh, and the idea is they're going to be putting out 10 to 20 times more projects, right? So that's the, what you said, you know, the whole multiplier. Um, the requirements for becoming a data scientist will be lower. I mean, the, to actually get that going, it's literally five mouse clicks, right? And half of it is like name your project. And, and, and so it, that's the whole point. It's like a, an airline pilot shouldn't know how to build a jet engine. And today, a data scientist is like a pilot that also knows how to build a jet engine. And that's absurd. Right? The only people that should know deep learning that well are the people developing the new technology, the new generation of deep learning, not the people using deep learning. They should be like the pilot. Right? And that's kind of, in a very high level, the level of knowledge you need to know to fly that plane, basically. Man, this is getting me really excited. This panel and la la last panel have changed my life because uh, in the last panel I learned that they are looking for physicists. I'm a physicist by training. Um, in this panel I learned that I don't have to know all the grungy details of the stuff, I just have to be able to map a customer problem. And we have a data scientist shortage, so I'm thinking of becoming a data scientist right after this panel ends. <laughs> so given that career change I'm announcing, um, let's just see if there's anybody in the audience that has some questions of the panel. We all thank you for staying for the last session of the day and uh, uh, being engaged. Thank you so much.